We will get started. Hello, everyone. Welcome to our monthly Science of Alt Protein seminar. My name is Priya Panescu, and I am a lead scientist focused on plant-based proteins at the Good Food Institute. And for those of you who are here for the first time, welcome to our community. The Good Food Institute is a nonprofit think tank, 100% driven by philanthropy, and our goal is to build a world where alternative proteins are no longer alternative. If you're looking to take a deeper dive into the science of plant-based fermentation or cultivated meat technologies, check out our open access resources at gfi.org slash science. And now I have the wonderful honor of introducing today's speaker to you, Dr. Alejandro Marangoni. He is a professor in Tier 1 Canada Research Chair in Food, Health, and Aging at the University of Guelph, Canada. His work concentrates on the physical properties of food materials in foods, um, as well as cosmetics and biolubricants, with particular emphasis on sustainability, preservation of biodiversity, and health. Alejandro is a fellow of the American Oil Chemist Society, the Institute of Food Technologists, and the Royal Society of Chemistry in the UK. He is the editor-in-chief of both current opinions as well as current research in food science. He has also founded and commercialized three major technology platforms with global reach. Dr. Alejandro Marangoni was honored as one of 10 most influential Hispanic Canadians in 2012, a fellow of the Royal Society of Canada in 2018, and an officer of the Order of Canada in 2021. Woo! And that's probably not even close to all of it. And um, on a personal note, I have visited Dr. Alejandro's um, lab and at the University of Guelph, and it is just amazing. Like any, pretty much any problem that's come up in the plant-based space, Dr. Marangoni has decided like, oh, I'll just work on it. Yeah, uh, texturize meat, sure. Make some alternative fats. Yeah, I'll do that too. Make a delicious vegan cheese. I got you. And I had um, the wonderful pleasure of actually being able to taste the cheese that he'll talk about today. And I have to say it was amazing. I don't think he'll actually be able to show the data on that, but you guys have at least an N is equal to one um, <laughs> case study over here. It was very delicious. And I wish that I could eat that plant-based cheese every single day. So with that, in today's talk, Dr. Marangoni will discuss his novel high-protein plant-based cheese made from waxy starch, plant protein isolate, and coconut oil. The sustainable alternative made with simple ingredients exhibits melt and stretch properties two to three times greater than those observed for some commercial plant-based cheeses. So welcome, Dr. Marangoni, and we look forward to your presentation. Wonderful. Thank you, Pierre, for that uh, wonderful introduction. It's always uh, fun to have um, all my colleagues come and eat with me at the in the lab. You know, some of it may not be the ultimate solution, but for sure we we work on every area that we can. So today I'll talk to you about um, high protein plant-based cheese. Motivation, of course, we're all here because we want to maybe improve on the sustainability of food products, um, but as well in consideration of other things. We do have to start really thinking seriously about the nutritional implications of, of, of the plant-based foods we do. I know there's a price limitation here. However, um, in my view, if one, it's good to get started, but I, I'm sorry for saying it, it's it's probably not a good idea to put out a product called cheese that has no protein. I mean, I think that's a little bit passe and we have to uh, work on uh, more protein rich uh, cheeses, right? But at the same time, we must also make sure that they don't become too expensive and too niche. We would really like to see, I would like to see products like these in every single fast food joint, uh, mom and pop shop, and that people are eating it with gusto in their cheeseburgers, in their mac and cheese, in their um, in their in their fast food, if you may, um, in their grilled cheese sandwiches. Uh, that's what this is geared towards. This is I have to. So I'm qualifying the small print. This is not your your four year old cheddar, and it's not never meant to do that. But it's meant to replace the functionality of your commercial cheese, which uh, <clears throat> which you find <clears throat> in things like pizzas and all these fast food joints. So uh, not to bore you too much about this, we all know that the that food, the global food emissions, food is responsible for about 26%. That includes, of course, agriculture in there. And that's a very big number. So anything that we can do in order to help 
that and look at the big contributors towards this, this little orangey light thing is livestock and fish farms. So livestock, we need to have cows, to have milk, to have dairy cheese. So, I mean, if we make a plant-based option or an <clears throat> alternative to that, that will go a long way there. And as well, all the food that is um, that is used for the, for the livestock growth as well. So a very large proportion of that emissions of those, of those greenhouse gas um, uh, emission equivalents, because they include energy as well, um, would be would be decreased if we went to the plant-based alternative. And uh, of course, in here we we have uh, we have we you've probably seen a lot of this diagram here. How much the uh, dairy herds is number four here in the production of CO two um, per um, per kilogram of food product being produced. Uh, they're not innocent. I know people say, well, look at the production for meat. But recall that many times the dairy herds end up as meat anyways. So I do not know how they divide it into these two. Regardless of that, the fourth one here, and look how high cheese is in that. Because of that, you use a lot of water, a lot of land, um, a lot of animals. Well, you need animals to do it. So again, that is the motivation, the altruistic motivation for doing this. Um, an environmental push, uh, both for the plant-based meat analogs and the one that we haven't seen too much I think is for the plant-based cheese. And I attended the last um, Good Food Institute conference, uh, the Good Food Conference, which was very exciting. We saw a lot of wonderful um, uh, meat analog products, but we also saw some pretty exciting cheese products, not my cheese, our cheese, but cheese from other people. And uh, they're finally um, taking that challenge of making functional cheese with higher protein, higher nutrition. Hopefully we can get to the lower price as well, or at least price parity with dairy. So categories of plant-based cheese. I mean, that's a very big name that people have used very loosely. So let's try to be a little reductionist about this. And excuse me, if, if you have a better scheme, that's perfect too. I'm just a scheme that we have. Protein structure and starch structure. So the, the, the phase in the cheese that is responsible for the, for the observed, the physical functionality um, is, is different for these two. So on these sides, you have the Violife products, Earth Islands, Daya, those are the, the pioneers, the, the first people that came around. But it may be that as well, you have the protein structured ones. For example, the chow one made with tofu, uh, tree nut would be from um, nuts, right? You grind the nuts and, uh, and, uh, and, and you make these cheeses, uh, for example, made with cashew and almond. Now we're talking about protein structured cheeses, or you can make one based on soy protein. So you would have a soy gel, um, a protein gel that structures the material, or you would have <clears throat> a lot of these products which are finely, finely ground, not ones that also rely a lot on both the fat, but as well in the protein in order to create the structure. Now they resemble soft cheeses quite a bit. I don't think you can get to a hard cheese very well with these protein gels. So the protein is the majority phase that provides the underlying structure of the material. That's what we're getting to. Now, uh, they're mainly eaten cold and they have very poor melt or stretch these things. So they have a high nutritional value because of course, these ones here, the nut-based the nut -based cheeses are based on, on tree nuts and tree nuts have good protein, good fat, et cetera, et cetera. So they're quite nutritious, micronutrients and all the good things. Um, Sometimes you can use fermentation or acidification to coagulate the protein that is present in these things. And the curd is pressed and flavored like the one for dairy cheese. Uh, again, the plant proteins form the solid three-dimensional network, which is the majority phase responsible for the structure of the material. Um, but there's very little melt and the proteins contract uh, or, or break apart. And there's very little stretch. The extensional rheological properties of the materials are very poor in that respect. Uh, so it has poor functionality in that respect. On the other hand, many of them are getting closer and closer to the cold eating uh, flavor sensation. Now the starch-based cheeses, on the other hand, the majority phases is starch. Now the applications for these are pizza, grilled cheese, nachos, uh, um, all those kind of industrial applications. And when you heat it up, I hope this is not in your way, you obtain reasonable stretch for these things and there's thermal softening. I don't want to call it melting because it's a thermal softening of the starch uh, that occurs. And there's many of these products out there, um, mainly relying on waxy starches. 
that's what you have to focus. And so people use tapioca, potato, rice, corn, or the high, or higher, the higher the waxy starch content, the better for this functionality. And they have reversible gelatinization properties. So you undergo the gelatinization transition, then you have the setback, it sets into a gel. After a while, it's a little bit slow, that process. And that's a challenge as well in making these cheeses. And then when you heat it up again, you break down the structure. So it's, it's reversible in that respect. Now, some products based on this technology on a starch base soften to a sauce. Isn't it the most annoying thing to eat a pizza, bake it, and then it seems like you're eating hot mayonnaise? Okay, so that happens a lot with these kind of cheeses. And they don't recover very well. And some of them actually don't soften as much. Maybe you've seen it many times. You see the cheese and it hasn't completely like molten. It remains softer, but as the piece that you can actually see the shape of the piece and it's just not melting. That is also a problem with these things. And when you try to stretch them, they don't do it. So this is the dream, but the reality is another one. They have good functionality, but poor nutritional value. Most of the cheeses, unfortunately, out there have no protein. And I think that we should be past this point at this stage. So let's look at uh, some of the protein content of these cheeses. We have the Daya uh, cheddar style slices. We have the Violife. We have Earth Island. Let's look at the nutritional profile. So zero grams of protein. Oh, zero grams of protein. Oh, zero grams of protein. And I'm not going to mention new brands that have come up in the market doing exactly this, zero grams of protein, the same old thing. Why? We got to innovate in this respect to gain consumer confidence and to be able to grow this area. We cannot put out these products out there and expect some kind of loyalty by the consumer. Now, if you if you eat a processed cheese or a cracker barrel, as a standard um, um, a cheese out there has three grams of protein and that's a processed cheese. So they, they have lower fat uh, protein content. And you have here this, um, uh, this um, a, a, a cheddar cheese, look, seven grams of protein per serve. So where is the protein in the plant-based cheese? Let's look at the melt. Of course, we all familiar, this is a Schreiber test. You put a, a piece of filter paper and pull gradations on it, and you put a specific size of cheese in the middle and you bake it at 180 Celsius for a fixed period of time. And you look at how much it spreads. That's called the Schreiber test. I wish I had a test name after me like that. Um, and, um, and then uh, you can see in the foreground how much it has actually spread. And in the background, it's a method that we developed. Uh, we just published a paper in which we thought when we started doing this, it's like we need functional tests. So let's invent a series of tests or, and use whatever else is out there in order to address all the required functionality of the, of, of the cheese, the thermal melting, the stretching, the oil binding, the hardness you know, by TPA and stuff. And look in the background, we ended up using a rheometer in order to, to, to cook the cheese, keep it really hot, and then stretch it. And we would look at the strand, as I will show you in a second, how much of it it stretches. So it has very good stretch. I'll give you a number. Look at the cracker barrel. Interesting, eh? Processed cheese, look, it has spread. It hasn't released any oil or water. Look how wet a regular cheese is, and that's all oil. So regular cheese, when it melts, it releases all the oil. Processed cheese doesn't. So adding a little bit of complication in what exactly do you want? Do you want a cracker barrel thing or do you want a single thing? But look at the stretch in the dairy cheese. That's actually quite remarkable. So we said that we like it for the functionality. So let's put some of these things through the standard tests. Um, they didn't spread. Oops. And what about the stretch? They don't stretch. You just break the gel in the middle. It, that there's no extensional properties to these to these things whatsoever. So we don't have any protein. We don't have any melt. We don't have any stretch. I really wonder what we have. So the research goals of this was to improve the nutritional aspects of plant-based cheese, improve, improve, improve the, increase the protein content, and developing the testing methods. And this just got recently, like a two weeks ago or less, published in current research in food science, our methods that hopefully some people will adopt or modify and make better. Maybe we need a, a joint project with everybody measuring these properties um, so that we can have some standard methods. Um, now we need to improve the mechanical properties and as well for better melt and stretch. How can we do that? So the, text, the, the methods, I'm gonna review them very, very quickly. You know, texture profile analysis, you put like a little 
piece of um, we we use a um, two two centimeter twenty millimeter by one centimeter uh, plug of the cheese in between two parallel plates and do a double compression. And you can do it at whatever temperature you want. And you can get a lot of parameters out of it. Um, maybe you can review them. I'm not going to tell you. You can get a hardness, a cohesiveness, a springiness, and a chewiness. And the initial hardness is you compress it by 50% or so, and you look at how many Newton's force it has. That's the hardness, the initial, it, so related to the initial chew. You can relate that to sort of the initial hardness of the cheese. And then as the material breaks down, hence the double compression, you get different aspects of it, like how springy it was, how chewy it is, depending on how much it recovers after uh, you basically break it 50%, which is really what's happening here. You press it, break it percent, you lift up the geometry again, you wait like a couple seconds and you compress it again. And depending on the relative uh, areas and heights and distances of these things, you can get these parameters. The Schreiber test um, uh, is used for melt and oil loss. You put a little piece of, as well of the same material in the middle of this gradated one, and you look at the melt diameter uh, versus the starting diameter, and you can get how much the material has times 100%, and you get the percentage stretch of it. And um, oh, there you go. And that's your spread cheese. And notice the cloud around it, that's the oil that has left the cheese as well. Um, it would be the degree of Schreiber paper saturation that you have in terms of weight. So um, you can also do rheological melting kinetics. We learned a lot about these things. So again, we put it between two parallel plates and we do oscillatory rheology as a function of temperature and see what happens. And um, that is really, really interesting. The storage modulus you get from one of those measurements is, 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 is an elastic modulus. So you can think of that as a hardness of the material. A loss modulus is more related to the apparent viscosity, so how viscous the material is. And then the ratio between the two, like the G double prime over G prime is called pan delta, and that gives you how liquidy versus solid it is at different temperatures. You can learn quite a bit uh, from these kind of measurements. And uh, so we did that as well. I'm going to show you examples of all of that. And when we started here, we said, okay, what's the standard method to look at stretch? And we found the fork test, or then some sort of like a, a, a geometry sold by our mechanical testing machine company. And that was pretty much like a mechanized fork test. And we said, well, this is not very quantifiable here. Why don't we put it in our rheometer? Not everybody has a rheometer, but we can control the, the stretch very well. We have a cup that heats everything up very, very well, so it keeps it hot. Then we remove the cup and immediately stretch it. And look at, at the end, we, we were measuring all kinds of things. The only thing that really worked for us reproducibly, like how many millimeters before that standard amount of cheese in there uh, breaks. And I'll show you a video on that. So that's just a stretch in terms of millimeters. So the idea then was to take, so now that we have some methods and we measure all the dairy cheeses, what, well, let's go to the other side and, and mix starch, protein, and fat, and water and acid. That's all there is in there. Okay? Now, we wanted to keep it simple with not too many ingredients. One of the ingredients is water, and the acid is just like lactic acid to control the pH, right? For more for microbiological reasons than anything else. Um, now, what we discovered after many, many trials is that we need to use waxy cornstarch or waxy starch in general. We don't want any amylose in there. We want the properties of waxy starch 100%. And you can get this naturally on modified starches. We don't want to modify starch. The protein, at the beginning, uh, we thought that, um, that we need to be with specific proteins, but we then learned that we can use any protein as long as you have the correct functional physical properties of the protein. And what we want to use the protein for is a particulate filler and passive filler versus an active filler. So we want our protein to go in there and interrupt the connections between the waxy starch. And you can see where we're going with the thermal melting. And for the fat, we didn't go too far, believe it or not. We're a fat lab, but we say, we'll keep it as coconut oil, even though we've done a lot of work ever since. And then if you think about this, eventually you'll end up with dispersed particles of fat. When they crystallize, they become a particulate filler as well. And it's very, very important to keep it maybe below 5.5, your cheese, and the moisture content of it is extremely important, uh, usually about 50%. Uh, but 
a few percent up and down can play a very big role in your functionality. That's all there is. Then we learn how, in what order, and to what extent to cook these things in a, in a thermal mix. So we make an emulsion at the very beginning. Um, then we do heated mixing in a thermal mix in which all these components are put together and gelatinization takes place. Um, you add the starch to protein, you heat it, you gelatinize and build structure with the waxy starch. It needs to be waxy starch. Uh, not hot enough for the protein to denature, even though we found out that they're pretty insoluble anyways, and that's what we want. And uh, high mixing speeds induce fragmentation and increase el elasticity. And then we refrigerate it for a few days in order for the amylopectin to form the underlying background network, which will give it the rubber-like properties that we want from these type of materials. We do not rely on protein too much for that extensional thermal property that we expect from these type of materials when heated up at all. Uh, it may play a role in the cooling, but not during this initial stretching. And so we end up with a dispersion that looks like that. Now, look at this, this is pretty cool. So what we really like is that we can, this here is an example with fava protein, uh, coconut oil, usually 20%, waxy starch about 12%, and fava protein, we can go to 18%. Why do I say 18%? Because if we if we go too much higher, we lose water. I mean, you're, you're in a fight for water in this system, right? You have starch, wants water, protein wants water, eventually everybody wants water. So um, uh, you cannot go low enough and you have to have enough water. So a real game around the 50%, right? Now, if you cook it, the temperature in the thermal mix to different uh, different times, you have we have designated it with those T3s, T4s, T5s, but it's a little bit different for each one of them. And look at this exciting thing. Depending on the amount of cooking, you get different hardnesses. So I'll show you how they compare with the dairy cheeses. You can hit a dairy cheese, you can hit a processed cheese, depending on the amount of cooking you do. Interestingly, you also have the oil loss and the and the um, and the um, and the melt percentages associated with it. The harder the cheese, the more the oil loss. And uh, but also the harder the cheese, also associated, but not linearly. It's a little bit variable with the percent melt. That's not as affected. But there's a definite relationship between harder cheeses and greater oil loss. It's looking more and more like dairy cheese. While the ones on this side look more like processed cheeses. So here's our high protein, 18% protein uh, fava based cheese. And here's your Kraft single. Um, so, and here's the commercial plant-based cheese. So um, we, we hit it 20 Newtons because this guy here, the Kraft single has 29 Newtons. The melt is 109%, 140, give it to them. And the oil loss is 54% and here's zero. Interesting. They have no oil loss here. We, we can solve that problem too. And here's the commercial plant-based cheese for that. Like, let's not even get started here. And these are the melting profiles in the rheometer that I told you about, super interesting, right? So here we have the different, let me try to guide you here. Here is the Kraft single, the orange one. Notice how as you heat it up, it gets softer and softer. This is the G prime or the elastic component. And this is the liquid-like component or viscous component. And notice that at a certain temperature, they cross. So it becomes at 70 degrees more liquid than solid. So think about melting and stretching. Now it's become very liquidy. And so that's what you want. You want that crossover. Now notice the example here of um, the, the example for dia, the green line uh, out there. Very, very high G prime. And the G double prime, believe it or not, is this broken line down there. They never meet. So very elastic, very hard. And when you melt them, it ain't doing anything. It's just becoming softer, but they're keeping the same ratio. It's not becoming more liquid. Ours, of course, is not a miracle, but they do get a little bit closer. Um, the black one here, you see, we get a lot closer around 80 degrees. Still haven't achieved the crossover that we needed, but that would be, it's quite a bit of softening. We can get the properties we want from that. It would be ideal to, to have it a little bit more. So if we actually... Um, it, uh, plot the G double, the, the pan delta, the ratio G double prime versus V prime. Uh, now you can see how all the commercial cheeses are down here. Earth Island, Cheese, Dia, Violife, they're all down here. When you heat them up, they're not very liquidy. So they don't stretch. Ours is here. And of course, the Kraft single is up there. That's, that's a challenge in there to get that functionality. Useful test, pretty useful test.
as I said. And here's a nice uh, showing you the uh, the stretches, how how it works fairly well in the rheometer, and that's the cup that keeps everything hot. And uh, I think it's a pretty nice diagram. You could almost do the extensional rheology uh, by filming that that uh, that that film thinning as well. And there, sorry, that's a result. Uh, our stretch, we're very happy with it. Here's the craft single stretch at around 40. Look at our Faba 18% ice uh, ice cream. Uh, cheese, about 18 protein, and all the other ones are in between and they don't even come close. So now we have a pretty stretchy cheese. So we managed to increase the protein up to 18%, maybe 20%, increase the melt, as you saw, and uh, increase the stretch. So we can get to three grams per serving. Uh, the melt is definitely, well, it's zero versus ours, which is pretty good and uh, a lot of stretch, but not every protein works the same. So here you have an example, and here's the, the, the maybe ingredient and Roquette and all those big guys, they should be producing cheese proteins so that uh, certain physical characteristics of the fava, um, for example, this is fava protein two, I showed you fava one, this is two, look at that, it's not working the same, right? Mung bean didn't do it, lupin is weird, binds oil like crazy, lentil does other things. Um, we have found out what the required property is. I don't know if I'm at, at, at free, very easy um, to, to let you know, but you can base, we can make it basic, make the cheese with any protein. It doesn't matter what protein it is, mostly, except for flavor and all those important things. But the, the protein has to have a certain functional property that makes it a passive filler. Um, so let's look at some of the, some of the things that, that we look at that. Uh, the protein component of it. Here we have fava one and fava two. That's trying to move myself around. Uh, so the, the one that worked and the one that didn't work, right? Uh, that's a good experiment. A commercial, these are protein isolates that you gave me or I stole or whatever, fava one, fava two. One of them has great melt and quite a bit of oil loss. The other one has very poor melt. Stretch, 39 millimeters, 18 millimeters. So that's not working too well, the fava two, right? And the melting kinetics, very different. No, you see how nicely this works. Eh? The tan delta as a function of temperature, quite a bit of a difference between the two. So um, we're we're studying uh, as well all the functional properties if we can find out. I think we know which properties need to be measured. Now, here's the key. I guess we are telling you the solubility at pH 5.5 and below, low. While the, P, well, the solubility at pH 5.5, high. It's got to be a a little bit far away from the isoelectric point, right? You cannot stick it at the isoelectric point and nothing is soluble. Um, but look at that. Insoluble, soluble. Insoluble, soluble. That's why concentrates don't work. And uh, water holding capacity, the one that, uh, very interesting that the FABA one, even though one of them, the solubility is low, it does have FABA one, a very high water holding capacity. And emulsion, whatever you want to call it, stability. And uh, uh, so the emulsion capacity of this one is low, while the emulsion capacity of this one is high. So maybe this kind of solubility high, emulsion capacity high makes sense. The water holding capacity, 5.5, you got to think about that one. While this one here is low solubility and low surface activity or emulsion capacity. And so the emulsion volume is much greater, of course, for the protein that is more soluble. But obviously, we don't want the more soluble protein. We don't want the native protein. You can keep it. We want the insoluble crappy protein in order to make the cheese. And uh, we now have better measurements for the surface activity of the protein. But it all comes down to the solubility. Um, we love to do experiments in the synchrotron. So um, we, we travel to the Canadian light source and do all kinds of crazy things. Like imagine if you can take a micrograph of one of these cheeses, you know, which look pretty weird. And, um, and imagine if every pixel in your, in your micrograph, every little pixel here is an infrared spectrum. Can you imagine, imagine the amount of information that you have in there? So um, amazing. So you can go and look at your cheese and say, well, what's at the interface? What's this? What's this? And figure it out. See if we can do it together. I told you that we can characteristic regions in the IR spectra, right? For starch, protein, fat. And there they are. I mean, look at how different blue is the fat 
from starch, which is red, from the amide bands, right, of protein green. We can, we can really use those in order to assign the colors to these things, right? So this one here is a, remember, red starch, starch dominated structure. Fat is, these are the, this is the fat dispersed within the starch. And you have the protein bits here and there within the starch. But two important things, you see like a majority phase here close to the, uh, to the, um, to the, to, to the, to the fat, the blue fat. Maybe you should have another color, it should be yellow, right? But the blue fat, um, it, it's in contact with the starch. Interesting. Fat stabilized by starch. Maybe the starch experts among you can explain that one to me. And protein is just a particulate filler. While in the FABA2, the one that was bad, we have a protein stabilized system, which is what I would have thought that happens. You know, protein goes to the interface, stabilize oil and water emulsions, whatever. It seems to be different in the dynamic of obtaining good cheese. You need to have a starch stabilized fat dispersion type structure in order for, to have the functionalities that you expect. So protein dominated, starch dominated. This is more surface active, less surface active. Interesting. But this one gives you the, the good characteristics. Sorry, this one gives you a good, this one doesn't give you the good characteristics. We also put it under um, uh, the micro CT. We can do computer tomography at the synchrotron and look at all of these uh, fat globules, false colors. Uh, we just like colors. And so this one here is the FABA1, the good one. And this one here is not as good one. So if you have a very strong emulsion, which then also your protein interacts strongly with the starch, once you're doing all the mixing, you do a lot of extension. You think of it a little bit as capillary rheology, right? You're extending that, that, that droplet of oil, but that droplet of oil has a very strong layer around it. So it survives under the conditions of mechanical input. Now, this guy here, you mix it and probably undergoes capillary breakage and reformation of the of the of the of the globule. Breakage, reformation of the globule. And so you end up looking at good cheese, bad cheese. One that has fat globules after all the mixing is said and done that are rounded as they should be, or they remain extended because they survive the mechanical input. Sort of a secondary kind of effect to the whole thing. Um, so Spherical structuring is of fat is what you want, as opposed to elongated as uh, elongated fat globules present, and that limits the stretch and the melt because of the implications of it. Because everything is interacting and forming a network that is too strong, uh, you want to disrupt that network, and the consequence of disrupting that network is that you get round droplets at the end of it all. So. Uh, in this case, we have um, developed a formulation. First, we develop the methods. Then we try to match the functionality um, to make a plant-based cheese. So we can, uh, now we're working, um, we managed to put up to 18%, 19%. Eventually, you run out of water. That's the limitation of it. Um, we found which protein properties work best and definitely in a background of waxy starch. Don't even get started. Well, the other ones work too, but the waxy ones are... And the nice thing about waxy starches is that they can be non-modified. And uh, I like clean labels as well. And, uh, and we also now optimized it, uh, the process to be able to create shreds that don't break up into little dust particles that have some elasticity, a whole bunch of stuff that had to be done in that respect for optimization. And you can see here the effects of the shred melting. Uh, it works wonderful for uh, grilled cheese sandwiches. I'm so happy to be able to offer my vegan friends yummy, delicious grilled cheese sandwiches, all that salt, fat, now with protein. You can tell that it has protein. Yeah, your body knows that it has protein. And um, and uh, as well for nachos and quesadillas. Quesadillas is wonderful. I've been eating this thing for two years and I don't need to go back to, to any dairy cheese. But I have to admit that we don't, we deal with very clean proteins. We haven't done the flavors. We would have to rely on flavor experts to flavor it. Uh, this is non-fermented. This is uh, not fancy schmancy. Um, so it, it, we were focusing on the physical functionality of the cheese and achieving a higher protein content and keeping the prices down as much as possible. There's no cellulosix, there's only starch, fat, and we have also tried many different fats and we can actually modulate the loss of oil by a couple of ingredients in there so that you can turn on and off the oil loss. It's a bit of a magical thing 
that I don't understand 100%, but we can modulate that as well. Uh, if you add more sunflower oil, it gets softer in the cold, but we can make a pretty nice and melty cheese with quite a bit of sunflower oil in it. You don't need coconut oil. And there's other aspects that come into play, like the wetting in the mouth and, and the sticking to the teeth and all kinds of things that you have to also think about and optimize, but all extremely doable. So it looks like cheese, it melts like cheese, sort of tastes like cheese. I need some friends at Givaudan and other fam and other companies to help us here with some flavors. Is it cheese? According to like the dairy diehards, we when we published this paper, one of the reviewers was extremely aggressive. We called it plant-based cheese. And my God, we never heard the end of it. We actually had to change even the title of the paper to plant-based cheese alternative because it was like a lecture on what is cheese and what is not cheese, cheese being only the dairy version of things. I mean, I accept that it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a mimetic, but hey, no plant, no, but what the hell? I think it looks, I think it's cheese. And I would like to also say here that this is the work of uh, Stacy Dobson, who is the PhD student in my lab, who basically, basically, I mean, yeah, working in my lab, but invented, optimized, uh, this uh, this thing as part of her PhD work. And now we're working together to try to get in the, this in the hands of as many people as possible so we can facilitate that transition to uh, to more greener products, more sustainable products, more uh, less animal cruelty type products and with the nutrition and hopefully we'll find a way to bring the cost down uh, in terms of, uh, but that will come with volumes, right? We need the volumes to bring the cost down, a bit of a circular argument. But I think that if you offer this, and I have done many times a cheeseburger made with this, the animal food eaters will not tell the difference because it's, it's mixed in with your burgers and God knows what else. Um, so having said that, I would like to thank our um, funding agencies, the, uh, the Natural Sciences and Engineering Research Council of Canada and the University of Guelph uh, for putting up with us and you for your attention. Wonderful. I always feel so energized when I hear you talk. Um, Dr. Barangoni, thank you so much. And I would first like to ask, um, how can we leverage or license the latest technology for stretchy plant-based cheese? Uh, yes. Well, because we developed this at the University of Guelph, um, um, it's, it's a technology that is in the hands of the University of Guelph. And uh, long history of always working with companies in order to make everybody happy. Uh, the University of Guelph is, has been a leader for a long, long time in dairy research and food research. And uh, our purpose here is, is, is to help the transition. So, um, so it, it's really a discussion that would, that would involve us, but the University of Guelph as owners of the IP. I recently visited the Plant Protein Innovation Center in person as well and got to see their food center. And it reminded me a lot of the University of Guelph. And um, I think you know, the similarities there is that the, it really did start as food centers, mostly for dairy innovation, but a lot of that equipment and resources can also be used for plant-based innovation. So I challenge you, if you're at a university that has a dairy innovation center, maybe yeah. try out, um, try to get them to work a little bit on plant proteins as well. Um, excellent. Okay. And, um, Someone asked this, but uh, which kind of starch is used in the market? Vegan cheese examples you shared. So this was way in the beginning of your presentation. And then later you mentioned the waxy corn starch um, that you're using with a 100% amylopectin. Um, did you use something different in those initial experiments or even try something else besides corn? The next best thing, if you, if you, if you didn't figure out that it was waxy starch you needed, uh, people use a lot of tapioca. Tapioca is on its way to become waxy. So it has some interesting properties, but you know, th this game of making cheese is a game of, 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 of margins, of small margins, advantages in functionality. So the more you can get to the waxy starch stage, the better it is. But tapioca starch has been traditionally used, but it has a higher amylose content. Um, and there's a little more to the story than just amylose and amylopectin, but that's, that's, that's a good guide. Uh, so tapioca has been also the, 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 you only see them, most of them use tapioca, but the, 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 the realization that you need to go all the way above 90%, above, in my view, 95% waxy, waxy component in the starch, that's when you're going to see some, uh, some really nice uh, improvements. Fantastic. Um, I know, yeah, formulation science can be a little bit frustrating. So the fact that you can 
uh, really point us in the right direction of what to use is so helpful. Um, Nadia says, thank you for the presentation. And there's a lot of love for you in the in the chat section as well. I hope you can take a second um, at some point to look at them. But um, additionally, she asked, why not using, why aren't you using an extensibility rig on the texture analyzer to measure stretching instead of a rheometer? Um, very good question. Oh, ah, I got an answer for you. I think I asked the same question. Is that why are you like, hijacking the stupid rheometer I need it for other things <laughs> rather than the stretchy thing is because we're lazy. And secondly, the, our machine comes with a hood and the little hood is like a little oven. So we keep it nice and hot. Otherwise, when it starts cooling down, you don't get reproducible results. So we've been lazy. You would have to build a, a, an oven around your like uh, your your texture of things. So it's, uh, it was already made. So we used the one on the rheometer, but if you find a way of heating it up and keeping it from drying, so the hood, then that's what you need. You need to keep it hot. Fantastic. Um, okay, going back to our starches and carbohydrates, um, someone is asking if there's a way to reduce the melting temperature of kappa carrageenan-based cheeses. I don't know if you have any insight into that or if you want to offer any insight into it. Yeah, I, I mean, I... First of all, my frustration when people call it melting, Stacy, Stacy likes to call it melting. They that softening of the starch or the polysaccharide that's in your matrix that's super important, right? That that's what we're talking about. It, 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 if we could drop that down, like so, be that carrageenan and be that starch, right? Um, it, it is very important. We are working on that as well, trying to soften starches by making complexes with lipids. So we're going back to the fifties when people used to use fatty acids and monoglycerides to form starch lipid complexes to soften the crumb of bread so it wouldn't stale as much. Um, but um, you would need a plasticizer or some sort of carrageenan. And I cannot tell you 100%, but something that really interacts with the kappa carrageenan, like a small molecule, one small molecule, and reduces the glass transition temperature so that you can actually get the softening. Yeah, that would be the technical term. I do not know enough to know what interacts with kappa carrageenan and what a plasticizer of kappa carrageenan would be. Glycerol is used extensively. I would, yeah, you know, like but I, you I can would only try really keep it under a certain percentage. So yeah, that's going to be tricky finding a plasticizer that can be used for foods in carrageenan. Or, or, or lower the molecular weight, right? Yeah. Hydrolyze it. If you can find a hydrolyze it just partially, not too much, you still need the structure. That would actually go a long way. If you reduce the molecular weight, to, to be able to, to be, well, you're reducing the glass transition temperature, the material will soften more as a function of temperature. Wonderful. Okay, this is a, a good question. Um, how come the pH needs to be kept so low of the cheeses um, as it can affect the overall perception of taste and it can be a hurdle for functionality um, when getting to the pH then closer to neutral? Come on. Food safety, who are you trying to kill? So it's, uh, it's uh, but you know, but that's a very good question about the pH. And yes, pH affects things tremendously. For example, the closer you get to the isoelectric point, the less soluble the protein, hence the more functional. The, the lower you go in pH, you have to add more and more acid. Let's say that you're like a lactic acid crazy person. You add more lactic, to in, the pK of all those acids is around 4.6. To get to a pH of 4, 4.6, you have to add so much acid, your taste, your, your, your cheese will start tasting like lactic acid. So it has implications for how low can you go. We learned from the cheese makers that they hit somewhere between 5 and 5.5, which is a balance between microbiological safety. You don't want stuff to grow on it, right? Bacteria, fungi, they will, but I mean, that restricts it. A little. But if you go lower, yes, you'll restrict growth of things like listeria and stuff but you start and you improve on the functionality by going that low, but at the same time, you start having too much acid in the recipe. So it will depend on your flavor profile that you have or how much acid, but lowering the pH is actually pretty good and better for micro, right? For microbiology. Yes, wonderful. Um, and yes, a, a big challenge in the space. And I hope that you guys can link up with some flavor folks. Although I will say when I tasted the cheese, it was one of the, um, 
one of the least like off flavor prototypes of plant-based high protein plant-based cheese that I've had. So I, I can't sing enough praises about it. Um, <laughs> but, um, okay. So I would love to ask a little bit more about the lipids. So we have a few questions in here. Someone asked, you know, why use coconut oil? It's so high in saturated fat. You did touch upon it at the and that you guys were playing around with sunflower oil as well. And someone also asked um, what's the impact of using the sunflower oil instead. So I don't know if you want to talk a little bit more about the fats and maybe how you're going to bring in your wonderful alternative fat technology into these um, uh, great cheeses. No, very interesting. We haven't published this yet or anything, but um, 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 coconut oils gives a lot of rigidity. We were playing around with uh, calculating a, an elastic constant from the, the TPA versus the G prime, we get the same number. And we found just by mistake, we weren't looking at it, that the, the G prime or the elastic constant by TPA, the hardness uh, between 100% coconut oil and the cheese is the same. And we're like, what? So the coconut oil for a cold eating is giving it a lot of texture, right? Because it becomes crystalline, becomes hard, the same way that milk fat does that. So what happens, I mean, you've seen a cheese that you leave at room temperature become soft, right? That's because you you melted the fat. So depending on where you are in that space, um, we now use like about half vegetable oil with coconut oil. Why coconut oil? Well, because it's not palm oil and palm oil kills the orangutan, sustainability, et cetera, et cetera. And, uh, and uh, cocoa butter, you can't really use cocoa butter because it's one very expensive and it tastes like chocolate. Uh, you don't want to use hydrogenated fats. So I don't know what else you would use. You need some saturated crystalline fat. We, we have some options right now, but that's the easiest one that everybody uses. But no, you don't have to go 100% coconut oil. So uh, it makes it the, the cheese softer. It doesn't affect the melting quite a bit. And I would say it really helps some of the functional properties upon melting. Uh, so you don't have to go 100% coconut oil, but um, you need some, at least for the moment, you need some hard structuring something in there, uh, be that waxes or stuff like that. And you can actually change the release of oil by changing some of the surface activity uh, around that fat globule. Just judiciously, you have to like, uh, we're trying to figure out the mechanism by which we would add like almost nothing of waxes or almost nothing of ethyl cellulose and there's no more oil loss. And so it's like, uh, it's it's not so much a structuring of the oil into an oleo gel or something fancy like that, but affecting the surface properties. And it's a bit of a, a question mark. It is possible to do it, but the mechanism by which that happens is a little mysterious. Fantastic. Um, great question here. Did you happen to try soy protein in um, the cheeses and, and uh, how did that function? Amazing. Uh, we uh, we were we we're working with a company out in the Middle East, and uh, they're very big into soy. And uh, but again, soy source one, soy soy, soy protein isolate from China. Uh, I have to admit that the one from China was nicer tasting, but it was more crumbly in your mouth when you ate it cold. So we didn't change anything, and we find that kind of variability based on soy, but. Soy has a very interesting property because it's slightly functional, even though we are using insoluble proteins, it seems that gets heat activated and that should bring things into your head. Heat activation means secondary structure. When you cool it down, it's chewy like, uh, like, uh, like, uh, like, uh, like cheese, like dairy cheese, which is a real problem in, uh, in a lot of these dairy cheeses. They become hot mayonnaises, like super soft creams. But the soy is exceptionally good at recreating structure um, after that. So uh, I think it will go soy and it's complete protein. I don't know, maybe there's some soy haters out there, but I eat a lot of soy and I'm still here. I also love soy, um, love soy protein, very good, complete protein, love to eat it directly, not give it to the cows. Um, <laughs> um, actually somebody also asked about, um, potato protein in, in the chat. I don't know if, um, you guys looked at that. That's also a really great, um, complete protein. Definitely not made at as high of a scale as soy protein isolate, but um, still kind of a cool uh, cool functionality, cool protein. We, we tried it once and it really worked well. It's just that uh, uh, we, we thought it was very expensive and there's not much 
I think it probably be better used elsewhere because it's a fairly complete protein. Uh, but you start adding five, six, seven, 10, 15 percent in a cheese, you're gonna have trouble supplying enough. That's a, that's why I'm a big fan of uh, things like soy, uh, just for supply chain issues and for nutritional issues um, out there. And um, anyway, so no, it, it's a nice functional protein for sure. Yes, there's a lot of upstream lovers. We have to pull before we can make other things uh, more to, more affordable than soy because um, <laughs> it's it's had decades of uh, supply chain optimization. So um, that's wonderful. I'm happy that you guys tried it out and potato as well. Um, really fantastic. And um, okay, so we have a question here about um, the hardness of the cheeses. So is it the case that the cheeses that were heated for longer um, were harder just because the water was evaporating or is there something also going on in the protein structure or otherwise? Interesting. If you take pictures under a polarized light microscope, it, it, like the more time, the more you lose the crystalline structure of starch. So the crystalline amylopectin. So you're basically, basically gr grabbing, uh, getting to a higher degree of starch gelatinization. That what then upon cooling it becomes harder. No, I, you're not. You're not denaturing the protein. It's fairly insoluble. The proteins are like completely like pillars at this point. But it, I think it's related to the starch. The only thing about this is after you manage to really, really gelatinize everything, once it cools down, now you will have you know the, the protein, the, the amylopectin becomes more dispersed. You have more junction zones, and and you actually make a stronger a stronger network. Uh, so it just, I think it's just related to the percentage of gelatinization of the starch in time. And I'm sure there's an effect of dispersion as well. You're mixing these thick, thick pastes, right? I mean, you mix it more, you'll have more dispersion of the fat and the protein around. But one of the key characteristics is the loss of crystallinity as a function. Great. Also, I know this is very rapid fire. So if you need to catch your breath at any point, um, please let me know. I feel like I'm bombarding you right now, but I'm loving these questions too. You guys are asking really excellent things. Um, one of the next ones here. So, you know, besides linking up with a great flavor company like Jividon or something like that, um, how can we control the flavor of these protein ingredients with their dominant beanie flavors. Um, so I know that's kind of like a next step for you, not really totally thinking about it now, but if there's anything you guys have tried or you know are thinking you might try um, or any suggestions for the audience. First of all, we rely on the good people, the good protein isolation people. I mean, we really rely on them for the flavor and functionality of the proteins. Everybody in that field really knows that soy is one of the cleanest flavors. And I'm trying to remember really hard what the second uh, protein was. I think it could be favas or something like that. Legumes have this green taste. And uh, uh, I'm sure they know a hell of a lot more on how to... Min I've always found that the heat treatments minimizes that flavor. But even the two sources we had, the Chinese one and the one we bought it at the store here, some soy protein isolate, very different flavor profiles. The one from China was extremely clean, almost creamy while the one from here had still that green soy flavor. So I really think that ultimately will be in the hands of, of the protein isolation people to give us things that have like a, a more acceptable, acceptable or less, uh, less, less different. But I, I think it's all acceptable, but less different flavor profile if you're expecting like a dairy kind of thing. Now, dairy is difficult, right? I, I don't know, I, I really admire people that do some fermentation and maybe they can add fermentation aspect to it. I'm just a little bit concerned that for a commercial cheese like this, I'm still trying to keep it as cheap as possible. Uh, I do not know what the logistics of fermenting a whole bunch. These things get poured into 300 kilogram blocks and let set in the cold for about one or two weeks and then chopped into little pieces or shredded. Uh, I don't know when you would ferment this thing. And I don't really know that you need a fermentation for like a quesadilla, pizza, cheeseburger, grilled cheese sandwich thing. You know, before I tasted your cheese, I was 100% convinced that we would need like hybrid products that relied on fermentation and stuff. And then when I ate it, I was like completely converted. I was like, we can do anything with plant-based ingredients now, but of course we can always use our friends in, in fermentation and cultivated um, to really make these products 100% what they could be. And of course, um, especially with Itai, um, here I see you in the chat, it's, I'd be remiss to not mention that we could even go farther upstream from the 
the protein isolates and concentrate makers um, and actually make these crops um, develop them so that they have less of a bitter taste. Um, there's definitely research in that of uh, just starting straight at the source. Um, so fantastic. Um, no, but if I may add at the upstream, yeah. since you're like into that, we're also looking at functionalizing the legume starches to behave like waxy starches. So the ultimate dream would be to use the flour as a whole if we could con if we could get to the functionality of protein that we need, but we're making some real good progress into turning these legume starches that nobody likes into amylopectin-like uh, functionalities. Uh, at least we got to the first stop, we decreased the hardness. Now let's see how the uh, extensional rheology works, but it would be ultimately wonderful to use the whole system, right? Yes, absolutely. So it would help with economics as well as sustainability, just making an already sustainable process that much more sustainable. Um, I love that. Um, I think you mentioned just a second ago about, you know, how these will have to sit around a little bit um, where when the fermentation would take place. But then also, um, you know, what about the shelf life um, just generally without even thinking about fermentation? But um, have you looked into the shelf life of your cheeses? Um, and the uh, low physical stability, um, is that going to cause issues or trouble with shelf stability? We're lucky that amylopectin doesn't undergo retrogradation that much. It can recrystallize, but not retrograde. So once it reaches some level of uh, recrystallization, it stays, it's fairly stable in that respect. Uh, what we found that people do is drop the pH and the lower the pH, the, I mean, we even have a company that drops it to pH 4.2, which is absurdly low, but it's not bad. It's not bad. And that nothing will grow at 4.2. So in terms of microbiology, and then you put that in a nice little vacuum pack or whatever, and nothing will grow. Um, in terms of physical functionality, we've had it uh, sitting around for six months, uh, our, our products, and without really any major changes. Luckily, I think because of working with the amylopectin, there's not too much retrogradation that takes place and that would be the only thing that that could that could sort of damage your, your your system if all of a sudden that matrix that polymer matrix starts changing too much to the point where it doesn't have the physical functionality and um, the corn waxy starches have been very good to us wonderful um someone else asked if casein protein becomes available from precision fermentation companies or even you know plant molecular farming companies um do you think that would be a better approach than using only plant based ingredients if you yeah i mean but then you can go back to the traditional cheese making like some of those tofu based ones so you would then have to just learn how to make a like well you would have a micelle i'm assuming and you would have the aggregation into into curd then the pressing of the curd and the salting. And then, I mean, in a way you'd be, you'd be, I mean, dairy cheese making has been optimized for, I don't know how long, right? A long time. And and we know how to control that. So you'd be in that game. And I think that, uh, that yeah, that would be very uh, uh, appealing to the actual milk producers because the technology that we develop is for the plant-based powder mixers. Like, that's why all the milk, the plant-based milk, are made by the dairy companies. Most of the plant-based uh, or the, let's say, the alternative food people are not large volume liquid handlers. So if you handle dairy milk, you're used to having a huge tank full of liquid. And that's what you need in order to make plant-based milks as well. That's the reason that, for example, Danone and other ones and are huge producers of plant-based milk. Those, that's where the plant-based milk comes from, from the dairy for the dairy producers and they make amazing and they know how to scale the lab. They're the people to do that. They're the same people who would then coagulate that soluble protein and make your yogurt. Those are the yogurt makers, but the cheese maker and the meat makers, those are powder mixing, they're dough makers. And those, they don't know how to use ice. So what you're talking about having casings, coagulating, making curds and stuff. Now you're back to the large volume ones which would belong with the dairy companies gone plant or gone alternative. Right, so I, I see the the milk, the yogurt, and the curd type cheeses that you make through whatever's belonging to them, while still have this type of type of technologies, which includes the extruded products and these starch based cheeses, probably made by different people. They they probably like their different business models, different machines, different expertise. 
it's interesting because immediately when I read that question, the first thing I thought of was the cost of the just the casing protein. Like it's it's going to be pretty costly in the beginning. But then as you're talking about it, it's like, however, you know, once it's developed, maybe that scalability, if it's already kind of available in the milk, in the dairy industry, um, it could actually, you know, end up lowering costs maybe downstream. Who knows? That would be an interesting techno-economic analysis. Yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> I, I think that's more a question for the people that ferment yes. things. It's like, how cheaply can you produce it? That's, uh, but I think, yeah, it would be, I, we know what casings do, um, but are you going to be making alpha, beta casing, kappa casing? Are you, are you going to assemble it into a micelle so it's exactly the same, or do you have any other ideas? Totally. Um, and then I will just say that, um, you know, consumers want very many different things. You know, there's general things you can say about consumers, but it's in general, very diverse population. So just having different options for different people is always really helpful, whether it's precision fermentation casein or a plant-based, yeah. fava paste uh, cheese. <laughs> on the other hand, on the other hand, maybe that casein will find itself as an alternative to the fancy cheddars and blue mm -hmm. cheeses and the super expensive well the ones that people spend a lot of money for the beautiful cold eating cheese i still think that these plant-based cheeses like the one i talked to you about i don't see how they're ever going to be like that for that cold eating sensation you can eat it and it's, it's good but if you're really a connoisseur of cheese you go well this is not exactly it maybe those um those artificial art let's call it artificial alternative casings and stuff will find its market in those, I mean, have you bought cheese recently? I had to mortgage the house to buy a piece of cheese. You know, they're, they're really, really expensive. So I think there's room for your product there for sure. Excellent. Um, okay. And then um, do you see a role for using hydrocolloids in plant-based cheeses? Yeah. I mean, um, we, we stuck to starch. Yeah, absolutely. The hydrocolloid, yeah. It's the base for, it's the background polymer matrix. So if you know... How you how the colloid behaves, what the thermal stability is, what uh, what the mechanical properties is. We need a background matrix, and since the protein is not really interacting, all we need is a particle filler and a fat filler. It should work extremely well. Uh, I guess we were lucky to find out that the waxy starches have those properties. I don't know of any other hydrocolloid that does that kind of thing. But uh, <clears throat> but yes, actually, it would be advantageous because. If you could find a hydrocolloid that did that, you could lower the amount of hydrocolloid added. We have to add about 12% starch, right? And you could up the protein. You could get above our limit of 18, 20 when you run out of water. So uh, absolutely, absolutely. But I, I, I have not expertise in that. Um, fantastic. I'm just scrolling. Let's see. Um, someone else also asked about another protein source. So do you happen to try pea protein? Oh, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. We have good pea protein, bad pea protein, medium pea protein, all the pea proteins, pea proteins from up and down. Uh, they're fantastic. Um, uh, until recently, that was our choice of protein. And we like soy right now, but I would say that pea gives soy a run for its money. And uh, because it also has a, uh, at least the pea proteins we use. I know that people that, that that work with pea protein are like, they think pea proteins taste horrible. Maybe they're exposed to it too much. But for us, the pea protein cheese was really good. So the same things that we said, insoluble pea protein, as opposed to soluble, you got to make sure that that is the case in the waxy matrix performs beautifully. I would, I would almost wonder if as good at least as soy or sometimes better. Okay, and I think this is going to be our second to last question. Um, is the cheese multifunctional? So you talked about it a little bit, but is there in the sense that it can be consumed cold? Um, so do you want to talk a little bit about, you know, the block, the consumption there, the shredding, like a little bit more of that? Because I was also incredibly impressed um, with that um, as far as your product went. And then this person also asked if there are any mouthfeel defects. Yep. There definitely is. But um, so if you want the cheese just for uh, the different applications that we talked about, you don't care too much about cold eating, right? So you we have one formula, which is absolutely minimalist, the ingredients that you saw. If you eat that cheese cold, it's still good, but you will you will find out that it's a little bit, at the end of it, you may be gritty, powdery, if you feel it in the mouth, if you're really looking for things, if you eat it ah, on a piece of cracker, it doesn't matter. But if you're actually looking for it, you will 
probably say that it's a little too um, grainy powdery. That that doesn't affect anything like when you um when when you melt it. Now, if you want to turn that into a cold eating cheese, absolutely. You add the gums. You add a very small amount of the polysaccharides for some reason. It all turns more creamy, more elastic, more more that. But you don't need that to melt it on the cheese, or it actually goes against the hardness necessary for grating it, to making the shreds, right? And so you would have probably a formula that the only difference is a little bit of gums. And um, and we have a couple of formulas that are great for eating, but then it doesn't really affect much. Sometimes may screw up a little bit the melting. So maybe there's an optimization between the two, but yes, in order to turn one of these, maybe a little powdery taste at the end of eating it to something more mozzarella-like, the polysaccharides, the gums, are, are necessary. A small amount of gums, just the guar, you know, it, it does the job. Fantastic. Okay. I think we're going to wrap up the questions, but I do want to leave us on a final note. I just wanted to see if there was anything else that maybe wasn't asked or you didn't get to impart yet. Some final thoughts for our audience on um, this wonderful product and um, I honestly, I just want to know, like, when can I get it in my refrigerator? So <laughs> me too, me <laughs> <Yeah>. too. <laughs> <laughs> Any final thoughts? <laughs> um, no, I think we all have to do our part, uh, to, to, to help this. And I think it's very important these days because of all the criticism we've seen and, and, you know, your conference was very inspirational to write, especially, uh, Ethan Brown's presentation was really, uh, gave me hope. It was a very hopeful presentation, you know? It's like, uh, yes, there's a lot of criticism, a lot of things that may not be seem 100%, but you just got to keep the line, you know, and uh, and I think it's very important for us to really address nutrition, to address a functionality, and to address costs. And nutrition includes all these, um, um, or like I'm, I'm sick and tired of listening to people tell you that these things are over uh, ultra processed. So we have to, we have to, uh, we have to learn how to make things with a minimal amount of ingredients, lower the costs, and 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 definitely uh, improve in the nutrition uh, and and the functionality. But I, I think it's really important for us at this point not to put out things that are nutritionally deficient out there anymore. I know. If I try one more plant-based cheese that's just made out of coconut oil and starch without any protein in it, I'm gonna go crazy. <laughs> so thank you so much for your work, Dr. Marangoni, and. Um, thank you everybody for coming. Um, please feel free to look back um, at um, other webinars, um, be able to look forward to the other webinars that we have in this series. And we look forward to you being more a part of this community. Thank you all. Thank you, Pierre.